An exciting week in the news. Two congresswomen were denied entry into Israel. Elizabeth Warren gained ground in the Democratic pack, and Congressman Steve King received condemnation for his latest comments. And we certainly had our share of newsmakers on this show as well. So um, one thing we did this week, Sagar, is we had all the candidates in Iowa last week, so we got some folks on the ground from Iowa to give us perspective. Let's hear first from Troy Price, who's the chair of the Iowa Democratic Party. Well, obviously the front runners had very good weekends. You know, yeah. Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders had uh, tremendous crowds. I actually uh, wasn't out for all the speeches out at the wing ding or out at the uh, soapbox, but I was up at the wing ding up in Mason City. Um, and you know, overall, I will tell you, there's just so such tremendous enthusiasm. And I think that this weekend really helped uh, try to get Iowans down to their, uh, help their, win on the field in their mind's eye. My perfect answer would be he'll beat them all and they'll, he'll beat them all easily. We know there are differences out here in Iowa in terms of his competition. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, oh my, I, I, I get down on my knees and pray every evening, please let her be the nominee <laughs> because I know that puts Iowa in the red category. My perfect answer would be <laughs> that guy was a character. He was quite a character. That was Jeff Kaufman, by the way, chair That's of the Republican right. Party. So we had the Democrat and then the Republican on in response. Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, from the Democratic perspective, they're like, wow, the progressives, mm -hmm. Bernie and Warren had these huge crowds. People are excited. They'd be formidable. And then the Republican clearly cheering for Warren because they have electability questions. And then that's her. that's really the true dichotomy. And one of the things I loved that we did this is these are the actually the people on the ground who are built with organizing the party infrastructure. So like with the GOP chairman, with, that's a perfect way into how he is thinking and how they're telling the Trump campaign, which yeah. is, oh, we really want Elizabeth Warren to win. That's somebody who they think cannot speak to the farmer base within that community. But at the same time, Troy Price is like, well, you know, in terms of the Democratic base, things are going very, very well for Elizabeth Warren and Bernie on the ground. So the dichotomy, it really could just not be more uh, present. Uh, it could not be a better view into, like, the competing visions between the two Yeah, parties. well, and yeah. part of what's happening, we saw, you know, this is a week that saw Elizabeth Warren doing well in the polls mm -hmm. in Iowa. And part of what I think is happening there is, you know, Iowa is an overwhelmingly white state. There's a fairly high number of the sort of white, educated liberals that Warren has her strongest yeah. showing with. And at the same time, you see... Kamala Harris, you see Pete Buttigieg and others tapering off a bit, they also appeal to that white educated right. liberal demographic. So she really is consolidating that base. Can she expand from there going forward? <laughs> to me is kind of the core question. Yeah, I, I have no, I do not think so. I think she has a big problem appealing to people of color, those constituencies, especially in South Carolina. And those, that is something that even if she were to, look, it's possible if she wins Iowa and there's a very real chance she could, then capitalizing on that, going into New Hampshire with momentum, the fact that she's already the senator from a neighboring state and wins those two, will she see a boost in South Carolina? It's possible. But if Joe Biden is number two in both of those states, then he has a credible case still at that time to still remain the front runner, and that's something that she really has to watch out. So yeah. I'd say it's make or break for her, those two states. Yeah, she's yeah. gotta be able to expand her coalition exactly. as the bottom line. Um, another thing we did this week is we really had a big debate on Medicare for All and the future of healthcare in America. One of the arguments that you'll remember from yeah. the second debate in particular against Medicare for All was this idea leveled by Tim Ryan and a couple other people, I think John Delaney, mm -hmm. that it would be bad for union members, that union members had fought to have good health care and that Medicare for yeah, All Yeah, Joe Biden said it too. He was like, well, the unions and I fought very, very hard for this. Right. So Sarah Nelson, who is the head of the uh, Association of International Association of Flight Attendants, and who, by the way, is currently in her position as union president, negotiating contracts with 10 different airlines, so really knows what she's talking about here. Here's what she had to say about that argument. And people are having to choose between cross your fingers, high deductible plans with lower premiums or pay the higher premiums. And even when you have those health care plans in a for profit system, when you're going to the hospital, you are going to a hospital where there's more and more understaffing because of the cost cuts within this for profit system. You're going to a hospital where they're taking time, a lot of time to get approval for the care that you need or the medicines that you need be, instead of just going straight to treatment. So this is unsustainable, and this is what union members everywhere know. And what we see in this, in this pitting union members against each other or non-union members against union members is that this is typical in any contract negotiations or organizing campaign. 
So Sarah, it's important. Sarah was not yeah. having it. She yeah. was absolutely <laughs> not. And it, no, it was a good, I think it's a great rebuttal uh, to many of those people. And I hope that many of them are asked about that. And the future candidates be like, listen, there actually is a very prominent union member who does support Medicare for all. And it does definitely undermine that. It's something that they're, they're going to have to answer for. At the very least, trot out their own union representatives who may not agree with Sarah. But we also had Chris Jacobs. He's the author of The Case Against Single Payer. Now, this was in a more interesting, nuanced takedown than just, oh, this is so socialized medicine and all this, it was focused much more on the amount of costs for the health care, the quality of care, and where the taxes would go up. Let's take a listen to what he said. Ken Thorpe, who's a Democratic economist, worked in the Clinton administration, uh, did an analysis in 2016 that found that 71 percent of individuals would pay more under Bernie Sanders' plan, even discounting the fact that their premiums and their deductibles would go away. 71% of individual households would pay more. 85% of low-income Medicaid households would pay more. I don't think that's the kind of reform Americans are looking for. I think it's fair to say the other analysts disagree with that. Some yeah. some do, but I, yeah. I, we've just seen actually in in this month, the Heartland Institute put out another study saying that individuals would pay more on net mm -hmm. uh, under a single payer system. Heartland Institute, of course, <laughs> very right wing. True. Um, I was surprised you didn't call that out at the time. And the, I mean, you know, yeah. I'm just, yeah. Yeah, I let it slide. <laughs> but, um, and, and the other person besides the Clinton staffer, yeah. so that is what it is. Sure. To me, look, there's this fundamental question around whether you can have a good health care system where the profit motive is still mm. front and center. And that was really what that debate kind of ended up being around. You raised the question yeah. like, look, we have terrible mortality and like people are dying yeah. earlier. And he said, well, yeah, it's because of the opioid crisis. Well, uh. yeah, that is fed by big pharma. Well, what I liked about Chris and I's discuss all of our discussion yeah. was that it, we didn't just, we were like, look, yes, the healthcare system is irrevocably broken. But part of the, what I really wanted to raise was that these hospitals and these providers are the really, you know, in some cases are just fleecing the United States government. I mean, that is what is driving up the price of all these healthcare costs. Costs are insane. And it's one of these things where I wish burn, I mean, I, I know it Bernie and Warren and all of the people have proposals in order to combat this, but these people should be called out, which is these hospital consolidation, gobbling up each other's hospitals, jacking prices up for American consumers, that is just as detrimental as the price of premiums, deductibles. I mean, that's what contributes to everything. And, it, and, it, and it's what I liked about both of those discussions is that these were both informative and really on the basis Fact -based of what's from better for people who everybody. have actually done their homework and know something Absolutely. about it. Yeah. Um, we also talked to Gordon Chang. That's right. So we talked to Gordon Chang. He had a big warning for us that something big could be happening in Hong Kong next week after the Chinese leadership breaks for a meeting. Let's take a listen to what he said. You have more dire Chinese warnings this time saying that the protesters are risking self-destruction. Also, you have the People's Armed Police, uh, which is essentially part of the Chinese military, is mobilizing in Shenzhen, which is just across the border from Hong Kong. Um, Chinese leaders are in Beidaha. That is their August um, retreat. They're there for about a couple of weeks, um, about maybe five days more. This is when they make important decisions. And I think that you'll see something happen after the end of the retreat, which should be the, probably the end of this week. Gordon's warning, of course, very prescient there. Actually, uh, right after we spoke with him, the Chinese military and P, you know, PLA forces were gathering on the border near Hong Kong. We saw those terrible clashes that were in the airport. Lot of eyes on the the eyes of the world really on Hong Kong. Right they now. are. Yeah. There's a lot at stake, obviously, for the people there. But there's this is also a big test for the Trump administration. It is. I mean, the president has said that if the Hong Kong protesters, he's actually tying the China tariffs to the Hong Kong protesters, saying that there was not going to be a deal or threatening that there's not going to be a deal if they forcefully come down on them. It puts President Xi in a real box here because a lot of his authority comes from the fact that he's a strong and big leader. But at the same time. You know, he can't he can't just start shooting people on camera. Right. That's something that would destroy China in the eyes of the modern world. Right. And that's what they're trying to lead. So he's in because a big, big problem. They want to have this veneer that, you know, this is a normal country with normal ambitions, no. et cetera. And when you start, you know, if you were to start yeah. militarily Tiananmen crushing Square, I mean. protesters, mm -hmm. it's a big issue. Absolutely. So as we look towards next week. That is one that we're going to definitely have our eye on. So make sure to check back here tomorrow. Um, we're going to have our first ever rising Q&A session. We're going to answer some of your questions from Twitter. Have a great Saturday, everybody. We're going to see you tomorrow.